a bit farther, and suddenly we're at the polo lounge. Charlie and Mary sit across the restaurant from Frank, who is with press agents and interviewers. They ask him if he knows Charles Crickus is in the room. Charlie comes over, attempting to get to Frank. Frank looks right through Charlie and says, You know, Miss Wilson, there's a tribe in Africa that when one of its members does something cruel or evil or betrays them, they never see him again. They just don't see him. They never talk to him or hear him or acknowledge him in any way. For them, he is dead. And I understand very often that's exactly what happens. Frank goes to exit, and a young busboy begs him to listen to his band's demo. Charlie just stands there. And then the ensemble singing, How did you get there from here, Mr. Shepard? And we get to rewind a few years earlier. And Frank and Charlie are being interviewed on television about how they work together. Here to sing, Frank from Shepard Inc. from Merrily We Roll Along with Josh Rossetti. <laughs> to sing this song at like one in the morning, which it feels like it is right now. It's going to be intense, especially when Lion Price is in the room. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. But here we go, Franklin Shepard, Inc. So tell me, how do you two work together? Uh, may I answer that? Um, how we work together, sure. But well, he goes, and I go, and soon we're humming along, and that's Paul writing a song. Then he goes, and I go, and the phone goes, and he goes, mother, 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 yes, Jerome, mother, no, Jerome, mother, 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 best employee, Jerome, mother, 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 do it, Jerome, take sorry, Charlie. So I go, and he goes, and I go, and soon we're tapping away. Sorry, Charlie, because it's the secretary, because on the intercom, yes, this buzz is the messenger. Thanks, this buzz, we tell him to wait, we order the car, we call the bank, we buy the ghost, we Sorry, Charlie, but I want to tell the stop, but I'll buy the rights, but I want to Money is a bad thing for an artist. Money? Did, did I say money? <laughs> no, I like money a lot. I mean, it's better than not. But when is money? Money. When you're in touch, money. <laughs> and you should be. Frank, Frank does the money thing very well. But you know what? There are other people who do it better. Frank does the music thing very well. And you know what? Nobody does it better. Still, the telephone's blink and the buzzer's buzz, and I really don't know what he does. But he makes a ton of money, and a lot of it for me, right? So I think, okay, and I start a play, and he somehow knows to right away. It's Hi, my buddy, want to ride a show? I got a great idea. Well, I'm all right. Friendship is like a garden. 
you have to water it and, and, and tend it, and you have to care about it. And you know what? I miss it, and I want it back. Nothing permanent has happened. Just a temporary kink. Friendship, something you don't really lose. Very sneaky how it happens. Every day you're on the brink. First the prizes, then the interview. Oh my God, I think it's happened! Stop me quick before I sing! One more triumph that I can't refuse! In case you didn't notice, this is my first time on TV and my last. No, here's the point, whatever happens. Then we'll all go get a drink. Cause that's the guy I love, the fella who's inside. But a butter, 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 picks wrong. Get the president, there's a crazy man. And, and they don't cast her. Girl auditioning was played by Mana Allen. <laughs> Each night, her who wants to live in New York? Uh, would corner belly laughs from the audience. And the second girl who auditions is Beth. Frank falls in love with her and winds up marrying her. Later, he gets caught in the showbiz whirl and divorces Beth for Gussie. By the end of the show, he's deserted Gussie for Meg. All these affairs, drunken parties, cynical confrontations coming out of the mouths of young people. Speaking of young people, there's Tanya Pinkins in the dressing room. She was in Merrily, and Liz Calloway and Daisy Prince. Uh, the show would preview in New York without having an out-of-town tryout. After all, it was expensive, $1.5 million. Uh, they'd done it with Sweeney Todd, and it worked just fine. So October 1st, 1981, first night of previews came, and the cast was excited out of their minds. But audiences seemed confused. They didn't understand so much information being given to them backwards. They didn't like Jim Weissenbach as Frank. Many walked out during the performance, and the cast played their hearts out to people's backs. Changes were implemented right away, and all costumes were thrown away and replaced by sweatshirts with lettering that explained who each character was. <laughs> now, choreographer Ron Field was replaced by Larry Fuller, and in a huge move, James Weissenbach was replaced as Frank with former ensemble member Jim Walton. Frank Sinatra recorded Good Thing Going, and Carly Simon recorded Not A Day Goes By, and those songs were getting recognition, but everyone in town was whispering about how troubled the show was. Opening was postponed twice. As Marilyn played on 52nd Street at the Alvin, now the Neil Simon Theater, a musical called Oh Brother was playing across the street at the Anta Playhouse, now the August Wilson. The show was generally liked, but got a lukewarm critical reception, and with no stars, closed after two days. One cast member of Marilyn expressed concern to the press. Everyone loved Oh Brother, and it closed. Everyone hates our show. What's to become of us? <laughs> <laughs> I just love the idea of some teenager crying to the spot. Like, just not enough. We're all going to be orphans. Um, <laughs> 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 Yeah. Uh, before rehearsal even started, Lonnie and Ann Morrison, who played Mary Flynn, went up to the Catskills to an ashram to have the Maharishi Swami Mukhachananda bless their scripts. I think I got that. 
you know, I'm not uh, They were completely confident that Sontag, Prince, and Firth would have a hit now. The creative team were the heroes of the kids in the cast. In fact, conductor Paul Gemignani had a shtick to cheer the kids up when things got tense. He'd hold up a chalkboard with a new message each, each night of the curtain call. And one night, um, Abby Potterman forgot an entrance and he wrote on the board, Abby, call your agent. <laughs> Uh, when the show opened, one of the main things that the critics found fault with was the fact that the roles were played by kids. It was Hal's brilliant concept for the show to have it performed by young people so that by the end, you could see how indeed their story could be different. They were at the beginning, but it was this very concept that confused and disturbed audiences. By the time that they got to the hopeful final part of Merrily, they were already tuned out and offended by the characters' behavior from when they were older. An opening night was at the plaza. The reviews were absolutely terrible ripping the show apart and comparing it to every Prince and Sondheim show of the past. Before the show opened, Prince had said to the Times, whether Merrily is a hit or a flop, and I don't mind that word, one third of everything I've done has been a flop, I'll do what I always do the morning after opening night. I'll call a meeting in my office to talk about my next show, something George Abbott taught me. It's the best thing you can do. I just got chills in my sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in New York Times, Frank Rich said, Mr. Sondheim has given this evening a half dozen songs that are crushing and beautiful, that soar and linger and hurt, but the show that contains them is a shambles. While many agreed that the show had been improved by leaps and bounds since starting previews, the word on the street and expectations were too poisonous to overcome. All three leads got their share of praise, but it was tempered with the sense that young actors playing older concepts just didn't work. Still, Ann Morrison won a Theater World Award, Lonnie Price was called terrific, and Jim Walton was praised as talented and engaging. But nearly every review was overall negative. Except for Clive Barnes in the Post, who said, Whatever you may have heard about it, go and see for yourselves. Merrily We Roll Along is far too good a musical to be judged by those twin kangaroo courts of word of mouth and critical consensus. It is the story of success, the complexities of compromise, and life lived amid quicksands. It also has that surging Sondheim sound that is New York set to music. Woo! Uh, but, unfortunately, people didn't go, uh, and the choice was made to pull the plug after only 16 performances. Betty Comden and Adolph Green came to the final performance with tags that said, Sad friend, pinned to their shirts. It's the most adorable thing I've ever heard. I've never seen a picture of that, so if anyone wants to, I just love that. Uh, David Loud, who now has over a dozen Broadway credits as a genius musical director, was in the show and understudied Charlie. When I wrote to him about our concert, he wrote me back and included the follow -reco following recollection of Closing Day of Merrily. I turned 19 the day we closed. I have a card from the whole company that says, Happy fucking birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody could hear a word of the finale at the closing performance. The kids on the stage were all crying too hard. And as Lonnie said, the day after closing, we went into the recording studio to do the cast album. It was as much of a fuck you as one could put on a disc. <laughs> I think that's why the album's so good. We were all so proud of the show, and we knew that the album was the only way people would ever know how great it really was. I'm as proud of my performance on that album as I am of anything I've ever done in my life. I think we all sound fucking amazing. <laughs> was made all the more poignant by its having been performed by young people whose expectations of a hit were like the radiant hopes of Frank, Charlie, and Mary on the rooftop, looking forward to the appearance of Sputnik and the lives ahead of them in the Our Time scene. As the characters' hopes were betrayed, so were those of the kids in the company. And just like Frank and Charlie ended their partnership, Sondheim and Prince went their separate ways after Merrily. Something had shifted. About writing Merrily, Sondheim said, In truth, like the characters in the show, I was trying to roll myself back to my exuberant early days, to recapture the combination of sophistication and idealism that I shared with Hal Prince, Mary Rogers, Jerry Bach and Sheldon Harnick, John Cander and Fred Ebb, and the rest of us show business supplicants all stripped back to our innocence. Sondheim called Opening Doors the most autobiographical song he'd ever written. <laughs> 